the practice of prayer. And without this practice, none of the other practices will be a reality in our lives. And this week, uh, one of our top marketplace people came to me and he said, you know, I'm a marketplace monk. And I am believing whether you own the company, you work for a company, you're a barista, you're in education, policy, politics, medicine, law, that we all could be a monk in the field, in the endeavor that God has created for us and us for that field and that we bring transformation, amen? And we do believe that. Being a modern monk is about finding the rhythms of grace found in the ways of Jesus. And everyone has a way they go about life. And I wanna ask you that question, what is your way that you go about living? What's your go-to when the world starts spiraling or at least your world? We are doing this series because there is a better and a higher, and I want to say a more transcendent way. The way of Jesus leads to transformation. In our monastery, your home, your life is always for God with others for the sake of the world. And I want to ask you this question today. Our lives are a reflection of what we give our time to. What are you giving your time to the most? And life is not fair. If you're Uh, Gen Z or a millennial, let me just set the record straight. Life is not fair. There's some people who are more gifted than you, better looking than you. I don't care how many filters you have uh, put in your face on Instagram. You may not be an influencer. However, one thing we all have in common, and that is 24 hours in a day, and our lives become a reflection of how we spend our time. And a life of prayer is one where time is intentionally and consistently given to God, and I believe it could change us forever. Now, my twin sister and I, we were born in 1960. The nurse dropped me on my head when I wasn't born, so if you can't follow me, that is the reason. And my dad, and I want to correct something. I was watching this class on the practice of prayer, and I said that my dad was a pathetic Catholic. And I've really been pondering on that. I don't think it was at all. No, he wasn't a legalistic or religious Catholic. I would say he was more spiritual. And I would say the reason why I've changed that, my dad may not have prayed like the Pope or a nun or a priest, but his prayers were heartfelt. And when we were born, we were born two months premature. Julie and I each weighed a mere three pounds. My mother's wedding band could fit around our wrists. That's how small. We don't have a picture of us until we won, uh, were one because mama says we look like monkeys. And, and so I don't know, this monkey turned out pretty good. You know what I'm talking about? I may be the missing link. I don't know. But, and so, but daddy was a chain smoker. And I have to say, because of that, I love smokers and I love believers who smoke. How many, how many of you ever known a believer that smokes? And I love it when they come up to me and they say, and this is how a smoker talks, Pastor Jude, I smoke. And it's like, oh, we know we could smell you. <laughs> And they ask the same question. They go, Pastor G, because that's how smokers talk. They say, Pastor G, will I go to heaven if I smoke? And I said, no, look, you believe in Jesus. I said, well, you're going to go to heaven. Now you're going to get there a lot quicker and smell like hell when you do. (laughs) And the reason why I bring this up to you is because I think people believe that prayer only belongs almost like men and women who are stuck in a monastery or saints of all. And I want you to know prayer from a chain smoker who has a business and living an ordinary supernatural life. Prayer is for all of us. Can you say amen? And one thing from that story, my dad said, hey, if you let the babies live, my twins, I'll never smoke. We did. He never did. And they named me. People say, were your parents Beatles free? No. They named me after the Catholic saint of hopeless causes, St. Jude. So if you're hopeless today, I got you. I am your saint. Now, let me tell you what that instilled in me. I am 64 years old, and I want you to really get this. You may want to write this down. Number one, that God is a praying God. 
And there's no other spiritual belief system that shows that their deity is praying. Jesus ever lives to pray. The Holy Spirit lives to pray. And not only is God a praying God, please get this next one. He is a prayer hearing God. I believe God hears prayer and that God answers prayer and that is one of the reasons that I pray and I love what Benedict said that you say what is monk what is monastery it's singular and it comes from Psalms 27 4 and I want you to recite it with me I want this to be a part of who you are one thing I have desired of the Lord can I say prayer must have our desires in it for it to be powerful and effective that I would will see that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and get this and inquire in his temple. Now, again, when we talk about modern monk practicing, get this, the ways of Jesus in a modern world, the ways of Jesus predate Jesus. The desert fathers are no, or a group called the Essenes. By the time they were in the desert, 400 years before Jesus, Jesus was born of the virgin, they believed that you should pray at least three times a day. And they got this not only from Daniel, uh, a captivity prophet, but also from David. Read with me Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, if you have your Bibles. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. It says, in in Daniel's upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. So even before Jesus, they had the practice of prayer or the way of prayer or the rule of prayer. And I love what David said. He said this, evening and morning and noon, I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. So it is a lifestyle of prayer. And prayer is more than reciting words and phrases. It is a way of life. And if you learn anything from my dad, the chain smoker, prayer must come from the heart. And it should be believed and we should have a basic line that God is good and his intention for us is good. Can you say amen? Now coming, and I want you to know this, and and this is powerful. Most of the scriptures, I want you to go from Genesis all the way through Deuteronomy, not that you're going there. Then you pick up in the history, Joshua to the end of history. Then pick up with the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the big prophets, the minor prophets, go into the gospels, the letters, the book of Acts, the epistles, the in the book of Revelation. Get this, scriptures were written to talk to us about God. Scriptures speak to us about God. But the prayer book of Israel was the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms was written for to speak for us to God. If you ever feel inadequate going to God with your prayers, do what Jesus did. They prayed the Psalms. And they had prayer the first hour, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth. They had him and his disciples kept the hours of prayer. I want you to look at Acts chapter 3 verse 1. This is Peter and John. It says, and Peter and John went together to the temple. Get this. At the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Now, a minister in the 80s, I heard them say this, get it, something supernatural happens. You may want to write this down. Something supernatural happens when a man or a woman prays an hour a day. But I heard Pastor Iverson, a mentor of not only my pastor, Pastor Wendell Smith, but one of Becky and I's mentor, he said this. Now, remember the other pastor. He said, something supernatural happens when you pray an hour a day. Brother Iverson said it this way. He said, rarely, follow me, rarely 
Did I pray an hour a day? I want to say that again. If you haven't really given yourself that much to prayer, Brother Iverson said, rarely did I pray an hour a day, but there wasn't an hour in my day that I didn't pray, meaning when I was awake. And it goes back not only to the Desert Fathers, Jesus, the disciples, and even the way of Benedict, where they would pray in each hour. And we see that. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Then I would like you to read Acts 10, 9. Remember, Cornelius gave himself to prayer. But then it says, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. Get this, about the sixth hour hour. And so you have the way of the fathers, you have the practice of Jesus, but Benedict had a rule and he based his rule that they would pray seven times a day. And he got it from Psalms 119, 164, where it says seven times a day, I will praise you. Now, I just want you to stop just for a moment and I want you to think about that, that in the morning, get this, and they would use the book of Psalms as a prayer book. And they would say, get in, in Latin, the first hour is called lauds. It's where we get applause. So when we begin our day, you may be brushing your teeth, you may be on the throne, but when you're on the throne, go to the throne. You know what I say to that? Let go, let God. <laughs> and you know what they say in the morning? Don't you dare complain. You praise. You know what I used to tell the boys? We'd get in the car. Oh, that Jetta was my monastery. Boys, put your seatbelts on. All right, Jude, pray. What did he pray? My goodness. For at least a decade, the same prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Amen. John would grunt. Uh, then you say, my nose is burning. And I would tell the boys this. I'd say, boys, you complain, you remain. You praise, you will be raised. Can I say psychologists say today, if you and I begin our day with a gratitude, we will experience mental health. Now, get this, so seven times a day, Benedict's called that lauds. We start the day with praise. But you know what they called evening prayer right before you put your head on the pillow? They called it vespers. And that they would take psalms of thanksgiving, and they would start with praise. They would end with thanksgiving. I believe if our day, day and night, night and day, began with praise, end with gratitude, we would have a different perspective. Now, get this. In a moment, we're going to the gospel of Luke. 2,000 years ago, one of the chief duties of a Jewish mother, and I want you to think about the mother of God. If you're Catholic, it's going to be easy for you. Come on, the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Mary. Come on. In my Catholic family, everything was Jesus, uh, Joseph, and Mary. All of Becky's brother's middle name is Joseph. All the girl's name is Maria. Why? Because of Mary. Now, get this. One of the greatest things, a Jewish mom would do 2,000 years ago, get this, would teach their sons and daughters how to pray. And you know what they would use? Their prayer book of the Psalms. Can I say the reason why I changed it? said, no, daddy wasn't a pathetic Christian or a Catholic. He actually was spiritual and he may not have been perfect. And yeah, he was a chain smoker, but he quit. But you know what? He showed us that prayer works. And can I say that I believe the greatest thing, maybe you taught your kids how to be successful, how to change the oil, how to cook a pot roast, how to play pickleball, how to negotiate a deal. Did you teach them how to pray? Because God is a praying God, prayer listening God, prayer answering God. Prayer changes things. Can you say Amen. And Mary taught Jesus to pray. He grew in wisdom and stature. Why? She was teaching him to pray. And you'll never guess what Jesus quoted the most when he's on the cross, Psalms. And guess who's at the cross, at the foot of the cross? It's Mary. I'm wondering if Psalms 22 was a prayer reading of that day in that hour when he's on the cross. And she's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken him? And all of a sudden, he's praying. 
praying, then all of a sudden two come into agreement and he's able to yield his spirit, then be put in the ground and that prayer resurrected him three days later. It is something about a parent who prays and models and patterns prayer. And I want to say something. When Jake was in first grade, he had one guy, he, his dad pray, played for the Seahawks. The kid got up, my dad plays football for the Seahawks. He's a Seahawks guy. I don't know why I'm talking like I'm from Alabama. I'm just doing it. <laughs> then another kid got up. Her dad was a baseball player, a catcher for the Yankees and the Mariners. He was one of the sports announcers for Fox Sports. She said, my dad's a baseball guy. When I grow up, I'm going to be a baseball guy. And I thought, I wonder what Jake's going to say. That boy... My goodness, his name's Pastor Jake now. He got up, his shoulders were just back and confident as his mother. And he said, my dad gets up before the sun. This is how he's looking, before the sun is up. And he prays. And when he prays, things happen. When I grow up, I'm going to be a prayer guy. That is one of the chief duties of a parent. Amen. Now, I want you to go to the gospel of Luke. And as you're turning to Luke, I want to say a few things. I I want you to know, for me, I pray about everything. And if you don't like that, then you really need to throw your Bible away. I didn't write the scripture, but it says pray about everything. So I pray about getting a good deal at the mall. I pray about a parking spot. And yes, I pray for football teams. Don't you dare email me or text me that dumb question. Well, Pastor Jude, doesn't the other team have believers? What if they're praying for their team? How will God make a decision? Well, first of all, God is God. And if he's all powerful, all knowing, all intelligent, I'm going to leave that on him. But he's the one who said pray for everything. And if he didn't mean everything and he didn't want me to pray for football, he should have said, just pray for spiritual things. And he said, but they didn't have football 2,000 years ago. Yes, but they had chariot races. And I'd have prayed that my chariot would have beat your chariot. (laughs) Now, listen. Now, all prayers answered. You, You need to settle that. God answers all prayer. But not all prayers go my way. Some prayers are yes, some prayers are no, some prayers are maybe, but not the right time. I am very glad the prayer I prayed in sixth grade to marry that girl, God said no. Because you see, when I was in sixth grade, Becky was in second grade, that was unlawful. (laughs) And Becky's a lot better looking than that other girl. Aren't you glad God said no to some of your dumb prayers? And don't come and act all spirit. Well, well, what, since all your football prayers got in, look, if they were all answered my way, I would be living in Vegas, not Ventura. <laughs> but you know what I learned a long time ago? If I cannot, be- please get this, if I cannot believe God to give me a parking spot or help my football team, how can I believe him to save a relative, change California, heal someone of the incurable disease? Our God is a praying God and a prayer answering God. Can you say amen? Now, I want you to go to the Gospel of Luke and really please get this. In the Gospel of Luke, he is revealing the humanity of Jesus. And I want to give you a book. One of my favorite books on prayer is a seven-volume book. It's about this thick. I've read it about seven times, and it's changed me. It's gotten in me. And it was written by E.M. Bounds. And E.M. Bounds says this, get it, get it, I'm going to quote it. To live well, you have to pray well. And praying well isn't praying long and praying religious and praying like a political stump speech. It's just praying from the heart. And I love what St. Teresa said. In my opinion, prayer is nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. And I would say that is the heart 
of prayer. Now, Jesus said this, when you pray, don't be like the pagans. And many times, if we're Protestant or a good old Baptist, we will say it this way, yeah, when a Catholic's praying the All Father or the Hail Mary. By the way, the Hail Mary, most, 90% of those words come from the scripture. And it's from the Annunciation. And they will say, oh, but he said, don't pray in repetition. What he was meaning is do not think that the way you pray, the style you pray, the repetition of your prayers that you are going to change God because God is un changeable. Prayer never changes God. Prayer changes me, gives me a new outlook, gives me a new perspective. And it's like St. John the Damascus. He said this prayer, get it, watch, I'm going to do something. Prayer elevates our minds and hearts to God. That's why we should pray. Even it's under the breath, going to the coffee machine, driving to work, facing a negotiation at work that's over our head. What about a little conversation between you and the Almighty? Could God begin to change our ways? And I want to make a statement in this political year. I believe history belongs to the intercessor. I say you should pray and you should vote. Now, I just heard a statistic that only 20% of this church will vote in the election. Now, if you're 18 and you're a citizen and you don't vote, that is a crime against this nation. And if you don't pray, I believe a prayerless life is a wasted life. Now, let's go to the Gospel of Luke, okay? We're going to go to Luke one ten, And we're going to begin just to see. Now, Jesus did not pray to get God's favor. He had God's favor. Jesus did not pray to get an anointing. He was the anointed one. Jesus did not pray to get a spiritual gift. He's all the spiritual gift. Jesus is showing us how to be fully human. Look at Luke one ten. It's an elderly couple, way before uh, in vitro. And they could not have a child. And it says, get this, the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. So there you go. They had hours of prayer in people. If you've never made it to a Thursday night, if you can't make it to the auditorium, our neighborhood was locked down this past Thursday. I participated in prayer uh, online. And I'm telling you, the worship was powerful. Maybe you can't bring your toddlers to prayer. Maybe you live 30 miles away. However, why not get your iPhone? Why not turn on your TV, go to YouTube and participate? One of the greatest things you could do is your children seeing you worship and pray. You could be in high school, take a break from studying. You'll make a better grade on the test. Okay, come on. Now, if you make an F, don't blame it on the Lord. Mom, yeah, I was praying. That's why I felt. Ah, come on, study, show yourself approved. Go to verse 13. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Get this, for your prayer is heard and your wife shall bear a son and you shall name him or call him John. So prayer being heard. Go to another one. Go to uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 37. And again, just showing how prayer makes us fully human. And this woman, Anna, a widow, was a widow about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. So showing a lifestyle of prayer. And she had an experience with Jesus Christ. Go to another one. Go with me now. And I love this. Luke chapter three, and we're going to look at verse 21. Now the other gospel says this, that when he was being baptized, that the heavens were open and the voice of the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Please hear me. God is not pleased with us because we pray. We pray because God is pleased with us. What stops Jude from praying when I feel unworthy? What stops me from praying when I sin? But at that moment, when you go and you begin to converse with God, you know what you're saying? I'm unworthy, but you're worthy and you have made me worthy. 
Now, Jesus, look at this. It says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heavens were open. Now, we know the heavens were already open, but there's something about a life of prayer that it changes the atmosphere. If you know a person or a relationship in your family where it's caustic, it has negative karma, I call it demonic energy. Can I say, you know what will change it? Prayer. Prayer changes the atmosphere that you can walk in the room and it used to be caustic now something's happened. Why? Because God is a praying God, a prayer hearing God, and a prayer answering God. Let's go to another one. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. Luke 5, 16, it says, so he himself, get this, circle the word often. I want you to feel the practice of Jesus. Now, often withdrew into the wilderness, Greek word, aramos, the sacred place, the alone place. Where is your place? It could be on a Harley. It could be a walk on the beach. It could be on a bicycle. It could be in the shower. And again, not trying to be cheesy like Velveeta. How many of you love Velveeta, that expensive stuff that doesn't have to be refrigerated? Now that's high class right there. Come on. It says, where's your place? It says, he often withdrew into the wilderness and get this, and prayed. Go with me to Luke 6, 12. And I love this one. Now, let me just say this. Every one of us have a calling. Remember the Verizon? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I believe one of the greatest mistakes of some believers is they, res- they get into a career or a vocation, vacari, that they were never meant to be in. One of the worst things for a business person to do is to go into the ministry if they were never called. Or one of the worst things a pastor could do is go into the business world if they were never called. Whatever God has created you to do, he will call you into that arena now look at this I think many times we miss it because we don't pray now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and to get this and continued all night to God and when it was they get it he called his disciples I really want you to get that disciples to himself and from them he chose 12 whom he named apostle Maybe before you make a career change, give some prayer to it. And remember, it may not be an hour you pray over it, but don't let an hour in your awakening day, and you don't need to pray loud and long, but let me just say, will you pray from the heart? Will you believe in the God that you're praying to? And don't make a God, 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 are you out there, out there, out there? No, he's right here. One morning, I mean, I was praying so loud. You'd think I was giving birth to an elephant. God! I heard God's voice in my heart saying, Jude, I'm not deaf. (laughs) Then I felt, oh, okay. (laughs) You could whisper his name. You could even pray in a contemplative way. When it says vespers, actually, that was contemplation. What is contemplation? You begin to give inner thoughts of the goodness of God like David. Where would I be without the Lord? Let's go to another one. Let's go to Luke 9. Luke 9. We've got to hurry. My goodness. 18. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and asked and he gave them a great revelation. I believe insight comes through prayer, alone prayer. Look at verse 28. Please get this. This is for someone. He went up on the mountain, not a mountain, to pray. And he prayed, and as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. I would say prayer has changed me. There are many times I've gone into prayer angry, dysfunctional, mad, sinful, and I come, that's the devil's lie, trying to keep us from talking to God when we're at our worst. That's when I need to pray the most. So I'm just talking to God, and I'm altered. Can I say something? Whatever you're struggling with, will you bring God into that area? You say, well, I'm embarrassed. He already knows. Just talk to him about it. Amen. Let's go to another one. This is Luke 11. Luke 11. And I love this. Now it came to pass. As he was praying in a certain place, have a certain place. When he sees, you have a beginning time, you have an ending time. That one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. 
John was taught by the desert fathers. He taught his disciples. Can I say, I think it's good for the church to teach on family, communication, give all the things we teach on. Do we teach and model prayer? Can I say as a parent, one of the greatest things, I now have grandkids and today in Vacaville, I think I could say it because it's public. They made an announcement that my Jude and Sierra and my Jack and my Lucy, 2025 in June, will move to Santa Barbara and start the Father's House, Santa Barbara. What would it be if I taught him to gain the whole world, but I didn't teach him how to have a conversation with Almighty God? Then I failed. I failed. Let's go to this last, well, two more. Go to Luke 18. Luke 18. Hilton, who started Hilton Hotel, one of my favorite modern books on prayer is Circle Maker. And in Circle Maker, the author quotes from the book from Hilton. And he said, get this, he was raised by a single mom and he said his mother's answer for everything was we'll pray about it. And he said, without prayer, our lives become disjointed. Get this, but with prayer, this is Hilton, the hotel magnet, said with prayer, get it, prayer becomes the hub of the wheel that the spokes of all our life, our finances, our business, our children, our, everything comes into alignment and that's when we become a little lower than the angels and we receive honor and glory and might on the earth and in the next life. Prayer changes things. Look at Luke 18.1. He spoke a parable to them saying that men always, men and women, people ought always to pray and not lose heart. I have in my Bible, when I don't pray, I lose heart. When I do pray, I get heart. Go with me as we end to James. James chapter five, we're gonna read verses 13 to 18, the longest passage on how to pray. And again, People hate this word, especially if you're a Gen Z or a millennial, discipline. Discipline is in the word disciple. It starts prayer as a discipline. Now it's going to sound like that Velveeta cheesy, but after 42 years of practicing daily prayer, it becomes a delight. Why? Because of an inner friendship with Almighty God. Here it goes. Is anyone among you suffering? We're living in a generation that's suffering. Let him or her pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms, the prayer book of Israel. Get this next one, 14. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, him, anointing him with all, get this, in the name of the Lord, in the prayer of faith, in the prayer of faith, in the prayer of faith. One of the leaders of the reform movement, which comes from the theology of John Calvin, said this, oftentimes when we're praying for sick people, we pray, Lord, if it's your will, heal them. He said, I don't think we're praying that because we're seeking the sovereignty of God. I think we don't believe what James wrote. Prayer of faith. Can I say we exist that anyone can believe? Prayer begins with faith. My father was not perfect and that's why I changed it. No, he was not a pathetic Catholic because you could have been uh, really a Catholic that up upheld all the rules and regulations but still did not believe in the goodness of God. Somehow in the interior of my father who was a chain smoker, he believed that if he prayed that God could heal Julie and I. And can I say, I'm glad they named me Jude and I'm glad it's not after the Beatles or Jude Law and I'm glad it's after a saint of hopeless causes why because it showed me that God can take an impossible situation a heartfelt 
about prayer with a smoker, and that is our God. He does not specialize in the super saints of history. He does specialize in those who believe that he can do it. And let's just read it. I love it. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, and we all have, any sinners out there? I know you're a saint saved by grace. Okay, saints, how many of you sinned this week? Somebody's lying up in hell. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a uh, man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half, um, uh, three years and six months. And he prayed again. And he prayed again. You should underline that. I prayed, it didn't work. Pray again. I prayed and I didn't get the answer. I'm like, pray again. And he prayed again. I want to thank, I'm thankful for being in a church called City Church, California. This is where I am. When I moved here 13 years ago, my pastor had died. Becky would be diagnosed. And I don't know, it seems like my theology was being rattled to the core. If you've never had your theology shaken, you may not know what it is. And what was it? At the core, my theology, because of my father, that's why I had to retract. I believe that God is good. But when Wendell died of cancer and then Becky was diagnosed, it shook me. And I went into a darkness. And I am standing before you today because of what James described. I think some of the most people with the biggest mask on usually are some people in the ministry. How are you? Good, brother. But yet on the inside, they're crumbling. David Ethel, a man in this church, a leader in our marketplace, you want to talk about a modern monk practicing the ways of Jesus? He would text me. I got up this morning at five and I prayed these scriptures Only God knew that I was yelling those scriptures at God. Have you ever cursed when you're praying? Then you've never felt pain. Job didn't curse God, but he cursed the day he was born. I may not have cursed God, but I've cursed in prayer. And if you don't like it, don't read Psalms because they have cursing in prayer. And David Ethels would see me through. When Becky would start chemo 12 years ago, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. And I had to get on a platform. Jesus is good, but I was doubting that. Have you ever doubted that? And Rick Green, forever I love you, Rick Green. Standing in my driveway at 3.30 in the morning when hell strikes you the most. And I was a praying person. What do you think I was telling God? Oh, this is what prayer gets me? And there he was. And strength came into my being. And I stand before you. I have not been perfect, but I am more whole than I was 13 years ago. And my path is getting brighter and brighter. And the real Jude is arising. And I would say, what is it? It is the practice of prayer. And you don't have to pray long and you don't have to pray religious. And you don't have, come on, if you don't know what to say, crack the book of Psalms. The enemy surrounded me like the sea, gnashed their teeth at me. I found myself in the pit. To answer them, yet the Lord became my deliverer. I thought I would pass away, yet the Lord was on my side. Oh, even though a thousand is at one hand, ten thousand at the other, it's not going to come near me. I will abide in the shadow of the Almighty God, and with long life He will satisfy me, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All my days, I've got breath, I'm going to praise Him. It's one thing to praise God when you get the million dollar job. It's another thing when you've made your bed in hell that you say, I still praise you. That is the practice 
of prayer. Stand to your feet. Whoo, Jesus, man, I got some gooses on that one. On American Idol, they call it the it factor. The voice, boom. Simon with America's Got Talent, you got it. I got God. And if I got God and he's praying for me, then I'm going to use the Bible Psalms to let it speak. Hear me when you have no words. When you have no words. When catastrophe strikes and you have no words, you read that and you will see God will speak for you through those words. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Nevertheless, unto you I commit my spirit. Amen. Put your hands like this. You don't have to shake them. Just breathe in. You know, Buddhists pray. Yeah, they do. The first sound of their lotus prayer, um. You know what that means? That they're going to practice perfect generosity. Say, um, ushers, come get the bucket real quick. (laughs) <laughs> Go to core power. Oh, let's take an offering. You know, Muslims pray three times a day. They'll bow to the east. And you know what they're praying? Surrender. The first and the last thing for a Muslim is perfect surrender. Yet Jesus modeled it all. He is the way. He is the teaching. He is the life. Just hands open. Father, I release a spirit of prayer. That it may start as a discipline, but it will become a deep delight. And there are those here today, ladies, I feel like God's saying become a little girl in a department store and choose everything you want. Go big, go home. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. God is going to heal the inner child of your heart. And you're going to skip again on the wings of destiny. And he's going to give you your future in this moment. Men, you're going to live again. You're going to begin to be bold. And you're going to begin to rise up. And you're going to be the man that God called you to be. Young people, I dare you. Begin to pray two minutes, three minutes from class to class in your head. You don't have to be a freak. And watch what God will do with your future and your life. Why don't you begin to talk about God? You're struggling here. You're struggling here. Tell God about it. And begin to invite him in your world. We will practice prayer. And we will become the best version who we were created to be. In Jesus' name, Pastor Steve.